from Kenosha to Chesterfield to the mighty Greys Essex. Welcome to the On The Whistle podcast. I'm your host, Zayn Nabi. As you can see, we've gone big. Who needs New York? Who needs London? Who needs Sydney? When you can hit up all these wonderful cities we're in where the beautiful game is loved. Joining me as always to dig into the Women's World Cup and boy, oh boy, have we seen a historic one for Africa, an exciting one on the field, as none other than Chesterfield's finest. One, Alistair Howarth. Ali, how are you doing? I'm doing doing very well, Zane. I mean, I'd love to say that kind of African football is thriving in Chesterfield, but I need to do a bit more <laughs> investigating before I can confirm that. But it certainly has been a wonderful week of, of football in the Women's World Cup. Amazing. And of course, we know that in Grey's Essex, there's a Nigerian restaurant, there's an African food shop, and there's Courtney Freeze, the best prime master in the area. Although today, Courtney, you're donning a jersey that is certainly going to split the audience. Firstly, Zen, I'd just like to say I'm a, I'm a prime master. Uh, on... <laughs> I don't think there's many people out there that would don a prime. And, and let's forget about this barbecue stuff. You know, <laughs> that's what, putting burgers on and things like that. My goodness. But uh, we're wasting coal. We're wasting coal. <laughs> yeah, we're wasting coal. Uh, Grace is yeah. beautiful as ever. Lovely overcast weather, slight rainy day, football weather for those that understand football well. Uh, beautiful. So happy to be here. Well, listen, it has been an incredible Women's World Cup. Three African teams making the uh, round of 16. You had South Africa put up a really brave performance in going down to the Dutch 2-0. You had the Moroccans who, again, incredibly qualified for the knockout rounds, but sadly were not strong enough for France, losing 4-0. And then you had the Super Falcons, who took the European champions in England down to the wire and lost on penalties. And that's really where I want to begin our story today. The Super Falcons performing outstandingly at the World Cup. Um, so unlucky not to come away with the result against England. Um, I have to start with you, Ali, um, and go, how did they pull off such an amazing performance against the Three Lions when many thought they wouldn't be able to go the distance against them? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm glad you came to me because I won't be entertaining any any opinions from Courtney on Nigeria with him wearing an England top after he's he's betrayed the Super Falcons so quickly. Um, but but you know, for for me, it it's been a remarkable journey. You know, the Super Falcons. You know, if if you haven't listened to it, go back to our podcast where we interviewed their head coach Randy Waldrum because boy oh boy did he tell us some stuff. You know, he talked about him not being paid for over fourteen months' wages their pre-World Cup camp being cancelled, them missing an international window in November to even, they didn't even play any games for a whole window, um, you know, players being owed wages for up to two years. You know, this has been a team in disarray. And, you know, they boycott, they boycotted training at the AFCON because they weren't being paid. They threatened to boycott their first match of the World Cup against Canada, which would truly have been remarkable. But for them to put that all to the side and, and play so well is, is such a testament to, to this Super Falcon squad. And I, and I think, you know, you know, it was one thing to get a draw against Canada, you know, to beat an Australia team missing Sam Kerr. It's still impressive, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's doable. And getting the draw against Ireland, all incredible stuff. But to come up against this England team, you know, an England team that has been the European champions, have some of the most talented players in the world, have Kira Walsh coming back, you know, huge boost to them, one of the best players in the world and probably England's most important player. And we thought she was out for the tournament and she makes this, you know, miraculous recovery. For Nigeria to not just keep up with England, you know, not just take them to penalty. England took Nigeria to penalty. Let's be very clear here. You know, Nigeria dominated that game. They were the better team from start to finish. They were all over England. You know, I think, you know, Kira, um, Lauren James is still trying to find her way out of Halimatu Ayinde's pocket. I mean, maybe she did in the 86th minute when she came out to stamp on to stamp on uh, Michelle Lozier. But Nigeria were superb tactically. Randy Waldrum was superb. Like the, the kind of ways in which they shut down England's threats in Hemp, Russo and, and Lauren James. And as well as the joy they got, I thought he was really brave not to start Oshwala. I, I kind of was saying that before the game. I said, I would love for her to come off the bench, you know, as she did against Australia. 
and let Onomonu run her heart out. And she did. And, you know, it's just heartbreaking that this team had played so unbelievably well, deserved to beat this team. You know, if they beat England, they can beat anyone. They can go all the way. I full faith in the team, but only to fall short on penalties. I think that is the biggest, biggest heartbreak of this tournament. Lauren James's red card was the big talker. Alistair, how do you think that impacted the game? I mean, on a very obvious level, you would think that having a numbers advantage would help the Super Falcons. How did you see it? Well, I, I think I, I kind of want to go back to the to the card itself. I think for me, it was I, there. There was such an element. I was really angry about what happened because to me, what Lauren James did. I mean, if you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. She gets tackled by Michelle Lozier, take kind of takes her out, and then as she comes up, Lozier is on the ground and she stamps on her, not too hard, but very clearly intentional stamp, and is sent off her v, uh, after VAR. But I think for me, it just screamed of not just Lauren James, but an arrogance in this England team. They came into this match against Nigeria, assuming they had already got through to the next round. And you could tell by the way they were playing, by the arrogance in which they kind of thought that they could just stroll past Nigeria. And that's for me why the red card happened, because James, who is my favorite player in the world to watch, supremely talented, had been completely shut down. And she's not used to that. And, and you know, I think that red card wouldn't have happened if, if England were playing a Spain, a Germany, a Japan, because they would expect that. But because England weren't expecting Nigeria to be at that level, I think I think there was so much more frustration. So I think, first of all, I think that's a huge part of it. Is it, it was, I think, kind of an indicator that England kind of really massively underestimated Nigeria. But I think, ironically, it made things more difficult for Nigeria because their whole game plan was shut down England, play on the counterattack. We're happy to, to concede possession and concede the ball, but we will be the better team. And they were. But then as soon as they got the red card, suddenly it was flipped. Nigeria had to be the ones in, on the ball all the time, had to be the ones pressing for that win. And I think they weren't ready for that. I think they weren't kind of used to that. And, you know, which is fair enough. They've been tr training to be the counterattacking team and suddenly they have the ball. And I also think that played a part in the penalty. Suddenly it was England did well to get to the penalty shootout and the pressure was on Nigeria. And you could tell that in, in the ways in which they, they missed their penalty. So I think, you know, actually for, you know, the red card almost did more damage to Nigeria than good because it suddenly flipped their whole game plan and, and it felt like they just weren't quite ready to, to play that way. You talk about the penalty shootouts, you know, for a long time, the England's men team were a butt of jokes when it came to penalties. This is the second shootout the Super Falcons have lost when you cast your mind back to the WAFCON when they lost to Morocco. Um, is this something that's becoming a problem for them, Alistair, or are these two very different and isolated incidents? Yeah, it, it's hard to say because, you know, I think not necessarily this one, but I think if you look, think back to, to the penalty shootout in Morocco, that was an incredibly unique moment. Um, you know, I, I think, again, you need to go and watch the highlights. You need just to appreciate you know, being in the in the stadium, when I was in the media box, I couldn't hear the person sitting next to me trying to speak to me. That's how loud it was. I've never been in an environment like it. Flares, whistles, booze, everything. Lasers in the eyes of, of the Nigerians. And, you know, they'd been playing for 60 minutes with only nine players. So they were absolutely exhausted. So I think that was kind of like a unique situation of itself. But I, and I, I think more with this is it felt like the England players were ready for penalties and it felt like they had been practicing and were, and were really ready for them. Whereas Nigeria didn't quite feel like they were kind of up to it. And one of the strangest things was Alozier taking the penalty with her left foot. She's right footed, you know, and I know she's good on her left foot, but I did not understand her taking that penalty with, with her, with her, you know, what I assume is her weaker foot. Um, so that, that was a big kind of question mark for me, but I, I think, you know, Mm -hmm. we, we, we've known for a, a number of years that penalties are no longer a lottery. You know, we know there's a lot of training and psychology that goes into it. But you, you kind of, I still want to say, you know, at that point, it's really hard. Those margins are so fine. And it did feel like England are a team that were ready to be in the knockout stages taking penalties. And Nigeria just weren't quite there. And it is a bit of a shame. But I think you can't, you can't fault this team because they played so unbelievably well. I guess my only question would be, why wasn't Asisa Oshuala taking a penalty? I think for mm. me, she's their best striker, their best finisher. You know, for me, you need that person needs to be first. We had the same issue with Egypt. The Was Egyptian she down men's position team with, five? I think, did she even take the fifth? Yeah, I think she must have been because she didn't take it. I, I hope so. I mm. hope she was in that at that five. But we saw the same issue with the men's 
with Mohamed Salah, he didn't even take a penalty. I, I think it was either mm. in the AFCON final or in the World Cup qualifier against against Senegal. And it was it's the, kind of this idea AFCON, like, oh, I'm correct. Yeah, he's like, I want to be that big player who takes the fifth penalty, potentially wins mm. the game. But actually, no, your first penalty taker needs to be your best. Um, and yeah. for me, that would be my only criticism of, of, of the penalty shootout. Alistair, I think that's a wonderful assessment of Nigeria and what's happened. Um, and on this podcast, you've produced some wonderful content in the build-up to the tournament. You spoke to Ashley Plumtree, one of our most successful pods. If you want to watch that, just search on YouTube. You'll find it. Um, you also had an incredibly candid conversation with the Nigerian coach, Randy Waldrum. He spoke about the issues around payment of salaries, access to resources, the camps, and of course, the standoff he and the players were having with the Nigerian Football Federation. Um, and I'm going to get to that in a second, but I actually wanted to read you some of the comments and interaction we've been having around uh, the Super Falcons uh, from our, our Nigerian audience. And um, here was a response uh, to the Super Falcons being eliminated. I just finished crying after the England game at the Women's World Cup. My parents reminded me that the world can finally see how great this team is. I'm not even Nigerian, but neither is Randy Waldrum. On to the next games, more club contracts for the ladies. You will always be awesome. And that's followed by a heart. And that was for Yoliki Yu. So again, this Nigerian team transcending borders. And then when we talk about some of the praise and love we've seen for Ashley Pumtree, this was a comment from Uche Un Wosa. Apologies if I mispronounced your name, but here we go. Ashley, you are amazing. Most importantly, you are a great footballer, a tenacious defender and a fighter. Your choice of Nigeria is a great one. Despite all of the drawbacks of poor management and underdevelopment, Nigeria is a magical country with amazing people. It's a great setting to position your life. The Super Falcons are, are an awesome team that can make history. God bless you. Again, lots of fantastic love for this team and what they've done. But I know, Alistair, there have been some developments that have come recently from FIFA Pro and in investigating the Super Falcons. Maybe you want to give our audience a little bit of an idea of, of, of what the next steps there are and what some of the issues that are still outstanding with this team and their federation. Yeah, so kind of as we, as I was saying, you know, there's all these issues around being particularly payments coming into into the World Cup, and you know, they as I said, they brilliantly put it to the side, but the players very explicitly did just that. You know, and I want to make you know I've made that very clear throughout this tournament, and and want to keep making that clear is these the reason why we stopped talking about them was not because they were resolved; it was because the players themselves said we're going to put these issues to the side, and we're going to play and we're going to represent our country. And now that the tournament's finished, you know, I think they rightly so want to have, you know, what's theirs, what's owed. And so, you know, one of the things that came out today was a, an announcement from FIFA Pro where they said that the team is extremely frustrated. They've had to pursue the Federa Nigerian Federation for payments uh, before and during the World Cup. And even some that have dated back to uh, July, I think, 2021, you know, again, Go back and listen to our podcast with Randy Waldrum. He explained the, what those were from a camp that they did in the U.S. When I think they played the U.S. twice in one uh, international window. Some of the players hadn't been paid. Uh, from my understanding, a few of the players still haven't been paid their AFCON bonuses either. Um, some of the U.S.-based players, um, as well as I, I don't, I'm not sure if Waldrum himself has still been paid seven months wages. So there's still a lot to be resolved in terms of what the players are owed and what they're fighting for. And I think you know, some of them have spoken out about this, you know, really refreshingly. Um, you know, Ifyama Onomonu was one of them, um, who's kind of, I think, featured in every single one of the games. And she said that actually, you know, we need more investment from the Federation. We need more support. You know, we don't, when, when we're in Nigeria, we don't re have anywhere proper to train. We don't have gyms. We don't have access to good nutrition. She said at one point, even in Nigeria, we've had to share beds, not rooms, because we expect players to, you know, we know they're pampered, but we're, you know, we expect them to have roommates. But she said, no, actually, we've had to share beds, which I think is completely unacceptable. Completely Can you imagine if somebody had to share a bedroom with Courtney in his prime? That would be awful. <laughs> I'm sure Courtney can tell us plenty of stories about that. No, Dana, snow now. <laughs> uh, Sorry, I don't mean to make light of a very serious situation, but go on, Alistair. I mean, it's completely ridiculous. Yeah, and, and I think it's, you know, the, these are the type of stories that you expect to hear. You know, 
we we did a you know pod talking to Desiree Ellis about her first steps into football in the 1990s with Banyana Banya. That's the type of story we expect to hear from then, from the origins of a football team, you know, making it rough, you know. But but this is a team that has serially won at the, the Africa Cup of Nations. They've been to every single World Cup, more World Cups than England. You know, they've just formed the best any African team in history has. They held England, you know, this is the first game England hadn't scored in 17 matches at a World Cup, which is just a sensational achievement. And yet they're still dealing with these issues. And, you know, again, Randy Waldron made the point that, you know, this team was given almost a million dollars to prepare for this World Cup. You know, they were giving nine, $960,000 just from FIFA alone, let alone money from sponsors, from the government, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think the fact that some of these players still aren't being paid is is an absolute joke and i and i and i also think that it's really important we continue to highlight these things because you know it's it's great hearing these stories about achievements at the world cup but it's going to be the real question of whether these teams are improving is over the next four years you know when the spotlight is away from the nigerian football team when the super falcons aren't headline news and you know media outlets across the world what what then is going to be happening and i think it's really good that the girls and the, the sorry the ladies have 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 spoken out now. I think it's really important that they have. I thought Randy Waldrum coming onto our podcast ahead of the World Cup was super, super brave. And I think they need to keep talking about it because, you know, I think this is the only way that they shine a light because this issue, as as we've seen, has been happening for years. I mean, last World Cup, uh, Desire Opranozie, the, you know, former captain spoke up about it after the World Cup and she was kicked out of the team for over a year. You know, the, the team captain, you know, she came on, she missed the penalty. But, you know, she's still a part of this team and she was kicked out for a year for speaking up. And so I think it's really powerful that, the, 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 you know, a lot of the players on the team have, have stepped up and, and spoken about this. You know, even on, online, we've seen Oshawala, Onomi, Ebi, the, the team kind of captain, have both retweeted FIFA Pro statement. So they're behind it. And so I think now it's, you know, over to the Nigerian Federation to, to kind of clean their act up and, and actually deal with this. Very well said, Alistair, and I I agree with you. This is why our podcast is here. We celebrate excellence, but we also talk about the issues that are important. And this isn't going to go away. We know in countless other pods with men's national teams, um, there have been similar issues. But I really do hope FIFA Pro is able to resolve this um, sooner than later because it's so important for the Super Falcons team to get to the next level and people to get what they deserve. And they deserve that money, particularly after a lot of disorganization before the World Cup. But now we're going to turn our attention to Banyana Banyana. Uh, again, a really fantastic run at the World Cup. Really um, fantastic attacking. Lots of flair up front. Um, but really, Courtney, when you look at South Africa's loss to the Dutch and some of the weaknesses during this tournament, for example, when they played Argentina, uh, it really was some calamitous defending. You were a person who has won the Premier Soccer League in South Africa, a crucial member of the back four at Manning Rangers. When you look at Banyana, what was going wrong in the back four from your perspective? It was frustratingly easy to see. And this is the thing. Um, Defending any sort of set piece was a problem. Absolutely any set piece. And I'm talking... Corner, free kick, anything where the ball is off the ground was a huge difficulty uh, for uh, Banyane Banyane. I I don't know why. Now then, when you have a team that's struggling to defend set pieces, especially from corners, where South South Africa looks so vulnerable, you then put two people on the post, front and back post. In doing that, you're actually making your goal smaller. Now, people will be sitting somewhere in the studio thinking, oh, but then there's uh, more of the attackers in the box. Having too many defenders in a box is a problem. It doesn't give your attacking uh, defender space to get to the ball and challenge to the ball, number one. It also allows your goalkeeper too little space to get out. So set pieces were a huge problem. Uh, I felt the criticism that the goalkeeper came in for on certain occasions was unjust especially for the Argentina game. Fantastic goals by Argentina. I don't care who was in the goal. They wouldn't have said, I don't care. Yes, there was a shout. And you must remember, Zane, there are rumours about this particular story. That the yeah, South African... Yeah, squad played at the World Cup, but there have been murmurs that um, 
the incumbent Andile Lamine is being sidelined uh, because of um, interference from the South African Football Association, right? Those are some of the, the, the some of the talk that's doing the rounds. Yes, th- these are rumors, okay, but they are very strong rumors. How how can this change just be made during the World Cup? So you you got to almost listen to them with more than just a pinch of salt. But looking at the Argentina game. South Africa gave that game away. South Africa should have been 4-0 ahead, comfortably strolling, missed chance of the chance of the chance of the chance. Argentina are a name. They are not a team that were performing well. And we let them back in the game, but with two excellent strikes. The first one, no goalkeeper would have said this. The second one was such a delicate, beautiful header into the bottom right-hand corner. You can't, you can't do anything about this. But we eventually get out the group. We get to the last 16. We come up against the Dutch. The one thing I've got to say to uh, about Banyana Banyana, Zane, and I don't know, I can say this about absolutely every team I've watched at this World Cup. The ladies' conditioning and fitness levels is unbelievable. The ladies' conditioning. Now, I'm going to make a, a, a bit of a point here. England played Nigeria in the last 16. In the 90th minute, Louis Bronze broke. You must remember they they are one man down. Excuse me, one person down. My apologies for that. She broke from right back into the right hand top end corner. In the 90th minute, man, the conditioning of some of these athletes. Like if you look at Tembi Khatlana playing up front for Banyana Banyana, mm-hmm. the amount of ground she covered on her own. This is a this woman who what had an acute well, Courtney, I'm so glad you mentioned Temi Katlana's name because the one area I thought the South Africans completely outplayed the Dutch in the round of 16 was on the transition. And Temi was vital. To that. She made she made those Dutch defenders look like they had cement in their shoes, the way she was moving around them. And I couldn't believe these players were elite European players because if this is the same Dutch team that can make a World Cup four years before and a lot of these players playing the top leagues they looked very ordinary. Their physicality was something that the Banyana back four struggled for. But in transition, we look superior. Um, Katlana looked a cut above as a striker. My word, she looked absolutely world class. Um, I just wanted to get your impressions on that because she was electrifying. You've got to throw into it. She's had a massive injury, Zane. And when I say a massive injury, I can testify because I had the same injury in my, in my time. She tore, she didn't just tear her Achilles. She ruptured, she ruptured it. So it came away from itself. But you wouldn't have and even it, noticed that, the way she was moving. She was out for months not being able to play. <laughs> now, she, obviously, the biggest stage there is. Her, you, you can see she's looked after herself fantastically well. The amount of energy on her own up front and pressure she was creating. She yeah. is a dream player for any team. And I'm just so happy that she's out there. she represents us. What a brilliant piece of play. You know, and, and Desiree and really and has and it. Yeah. someone like that. All you are saying to the rest, be tight in defense. That's it. And our vulnerability was defense. And, and Alistair, I was going to say, Tembi, particularly at the tournament, you know, coming from a lot of issues back home um, with family members and, and passing, I mean, she really psychologically, you know, maybe talked to what, what frame of mind she might have been in playing in this tournament. I think the one the one word that I've always that I always associate with Tembi Hatlana more than anyone else in world football, maybe even sport, is tenacious she is so tenacious she's yeah unbelievably fast and you know physically dominant despite being really short but for me the, the, what I think sets her apart is you know I always say this about her there's no one better in world football than turning a terrible pass into a wonder ball because and, and you know the first time I watched her live was, was that that uh that first match of the the WAFCON last year last year when when they when Banyana beat um Nigeria 1-0 and the amount of times that, you know, a really bad ball was played over the top. She's 20 meters behind the defender. And yet she, she just keeps running. She just keeps running. She just, and she make, and suddenly she's there and she's in the corner. She's got the ball. And I think, you know, and you can see that in the way, like Courtney said, the way she's recovered from this injury, you know, she played like three or four matches before this world cup in the last year. 
you know, for her to come and hit the ground running, you could tell the final touch wasn't quite there. She wasn't quite 100%. You know, you could tell that, you know, the finish wasn't quite there. She wasn't quite as clinical as we know her to be. Um, but I think, you know, it's such a testament to to her, her capacity to to work hard and, and to come back, you know, the way she's managed herself. I think she's done done brilliantly. I mean, yeah, I, I think, well, I the one thing I would say about Banyana Banyana on the pitch is if they could learn to defend corners, they would have won the World Cup <laughs> because they, they played such good football, were excellent, but any corner any team got, I, I thought it was going to be a goal. And they let in a goal off a corner in every single match, you know, against Sweden, against Argentina, against Italy, against the Netherlands, you know. It, and that, for me, was the biggest disappointment with, with Banyana because, for me, I think Desiree Ellis is, you know, we've had her on this podcast a couple times. We know what a brilliant coach she is, what a trailblazer she is, how she's turned this Banyana team into, into world fighters. But for me, that was the disappointing thing is we knew, you know, we knew going into this tournament that South Africa probably had, I think, the shortest team in the World Cup. I think maybe Japan and, and one and one other Asian team might be with them. So we knew that they were going to come up against Sweden, a huge team. We knew if they got through the group, they'd be coming up against the Netherlands or the US, big physical teams. And I think for me, that's the frustrating thing. And again, compare them to Japan, Japan playing Norway, Norway, much bigger, much more physically dominant team. Japan never looked under threat off corners. And I think for me, that's the frustrating thing with Banyana is that's the one thing. If they could have just learned to defend corners, they... You know, they, they they could have beat the Dutch. They were so unfortunate. And again, the, again, and if and in, again, if a huge part of that as well as as much as you can coach that, a huge part of that is the keeper behind. And Kaylin Swart, you know, she she's a great person to have around the camp. I think she really improved in this tournament despite really difficult circumstances. But again, if Andile, uh, if Andile de Damini is starting, I think South Africa have a much, much better chance of A, topping their group, because let's bear in mind, they should have won this group. They were beating Sweden until the near, near the end. They were 2-0 up against Argentina. They were beating Italy. They should have won that group. But for me, if you have Andile Dlamini, she's taller. She's far more dominant in the air. She's better at her distribution. And, and she's she's one of the captains. You know, bear in mind, at the AFCON, she was one of the three captains with Van Dijk and with, with Jane. So I think for me, again, once again, this 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 tournament has been overshadowed. A brilliant record breaking performance by an African team is being overshadowed by a federation that's meddling and, and not treating the, the team with the respect it deserves. Zane, but I'm tired of this saying. Uh, you know, I, I'm firstly Elisa, the way he's he's magnified all those areas, I think was fantastic. Uh, I, you know, I, the frustrations defensively of Bafana Bafana, especially from set pieces, I was frightened. They were like penalties, basically, for me. Every time they had a corner a penalty, I was just thinking to myself, for goodness sake, this team's going to score. They, they just looked like they were a, a group of novices put together to defend set pieces, right? And I, and I know that's a very disrespectful statement to make especially to a very knowledgeable coach like Desiree. But the anxiety that was felt every time we had a corner, I, I couldn't stop. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't. But the way we... If you go back into history, as in, and I, I'm going to go on to the point Alistair just mentioned, the political stuff that always gets drawn into these tournaments, if you just go back into history, mm -hmm. it's always... And I'm telling you this now, wait for Bafana Bafana at the next FCON. It's going to follow them as well. It's going to go with them, right? I'm sick and tired of this thing. It always happens. If you go back to the Delron Buckley interview, 2002, South Korea and Japan, mm -hmm. we playing France, we playing uh, Spain, correct, in the last uh, 32. Three o'clock in the morning, fighting for bonuses. There's your first one, okay? Imagine that. A lot of the supporters forget about this. Fighting for bonuses 3 o'clock in the morning because the internationals and South African players. Then you go back to this, look at this Desiree situation uh, she has to deal with prior to the World Cup. Look at that humiliation, you know. Uh, how, how does that happen? And this is happening under Danny Joran's watch. Then we go into the World Cup, the best goalkeeper, and there has to be credence in this rumor. There has to be. It can't just happen. How can one of... Alice has just mentioned, she's one of the leadership group members here. How does she all of a sudden, minus the injury, she's sitting on the bench, not playing. So someone's got to put their foot down and almost, and I say this very respectfully, 
disabled the team now. No, no, no. We're going we're gonna to handbrake you, yeah? We're not going to give you your best player because she uh, started uh, the potentially, let's use the words potentially, started the struggle. When is this going to stop? Mm -hmm. And then I'll listen to the Nigerian situation. For goodness sake, when is this going to stop? How can you not pay the manager? Mm -hmm. What's it? Fourteen months, Alistair? Did you say? I think it was twelve. At one months. point, at one point, fourteen months. How does this happen? But then you want the person to go out, be disciplined, show loyalty, and put on a performance. Mm -hmm. These type of stories won't stop. And, and Courtney, bear in mind, you know, we say she, she, you know, she allegedly what the reason why Lamini would have been dropped for for uh, this tournament is because she quote unquote led this revolt against. Safa in that Botswana game. Let's remember why the team refused to play that game. A, they weren't being p uh, paid the bonuses that, that they were owed by FIFA. And B, they didn't want to play on a pitch that had not been qualified to, to, for PSL matches. So this is a, a, a pitch that had been said, this is not good enough for the men's teams. Not, not, the, not Bafana Bafana, the PSL, okay? Let's be, you know, this, this is not good enough for our club football for the men's. But our national women's team, this is good enough. This is what we want to see them playing in. For me, it's it's outrageous. And and for me, the biggest thing is South Africa wants to host the next Women's World Cup. And and by all rights and purposes, they sh they have one of the strongest bids in many ways. You know, it's never been to Africa. They've had a track record of hosting a much bigger Men's World Cup. You know, they've just hosted the the women's netball. They've you know, they, this is a country that knows how to host a, a you know a big tournament. Yes, yeah. there's load shedding. Yes, there's issues. Yeah. But how, how can you, as a federation, expect to win a, a bid to, to host a World Cup when you don't pay your, play, uh, your own team? They have to strike. And yet, yeah, like, you know, we had Desiree Ellis coaching a team of Sassel League players. This is the equivalent of, what, League One players playing at, for a national team. And on top of that, we still don't have. And again, we, we see the players talking about this. Janine Van Baik has been really vocal about this in particular. We still don't have a professional league in South Africa. For me, that is the biggest shame is, is there's two, maybe three teams that are fully professional women's football in South Africa. And for me, that's, that's still not good enough. You know, so with, with, a, with a league as rich as the PSL, because, you know, the PSL is one of the strongest leagues in Africa. It has lots of money, you know, it has a lot of strong teams. The fact that there isn't, you know, a Kaiser Chiefs women's team that's fully professional or an Orlando Pirates team that's fully professional. You know, for me, that is the, that is, I can't believe that South Africa, you know, from my mind, they shouldn't win this bid. So I'm hoping in the next two to three years, they turn it around because I want, I want to be there in South Africa at the next Women's World Cup covering it. And I think South Africa deserves to host it. But the way that it's been, this team has been treated, women's football has been treated, despite their success. You know, again, let's remind ourselves, Bavana Bavana haven't been to the World Cup since 2010. You know, they weren't at the last AFCON uh, at the, uh, you know, at the Afcon before that, to, to be fair, they got a good they got a good result, but they have not been successful. Banyana Banyana back to back Afcon finalists won the last Afcon, and for the and then got further than any South African team, men or women's, at the World Cup this time around. So I think for me again, it's a huge shame that they're not getting the support that they deserve. Elsa, you mentioned a very good point there, and and I love the fact that you brought the netball in because the netball World Cup that was held in South Africa. Uh, I watched all the games as well. It was such a successful event. I, I, I was shocked at the, 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 the fantastic organization, the coverage, um, and, and, and what the players were given in terms of practice and preparations before games. You were able to see that. What, what a wonderful advert. I would love us to host the Women's World Cup, as, as you just said. But you're not treating the players right. So, so how do you bring the rest of the world to us when you're not treating your players right? When there is no set-up league in there to 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 bring on the next Tembi, to bring on the next uh, Glaminis, to bring on the next Kellen Swartz. There, there, there is no league. Uh, it's just so saddening, you know, because with all of those um, obstacles in front, Desiree puts out a team that attacked the world, I must say. I was mm -hmm. shocked at the ability of some of the players. And I know this may sound patronizing, and I know I've touched on this before. I cannot believe the energy levels, the industry. And in South Africa had an element of street and European football involved as well, which, which that's the brilliant part that I enjoyed watching. Mm -hmm. You know, you could see, see the culture of us in our play. It was shocking. 
I would I would say every time Bafana Bafana play, put the TV off. They make me sick. I, I, I'd watch Banyana Banyana any day of the week. <laughs> now, Zayn, I know you want to move on, and I'll be very br brief, but I, I know we've been very negative in this last kind of 15, 20 minutes about both Nigeria and South Africa. But I want to say that there's been a lot of people saying, you know, why are why should these players be speaking up? Why, you know, it's not going to make a difference. But I think, you know, I think it will make a difference. And I think these teams have never done so well before and they've never had such a spotlight on them. And I think a good example is I'm just looking at, at kind of social media now and I'm seeing, you know, Odian Gallo saying NFF never still stops these things. I'm seeing Victor Anichebe, former Super uh, Eagles player, tweeting about it, saying NFF, tagging them, I think on Instagram this one, saying pay them, they've done us proud. And Victor Ozyman, Af one of Africa's best players, Nigeria's best player, the best striker, you know, are almost one of the best strikers in world football, maybe only behind maybe Erling Haaland, saying pay them and again tagging the NFF. So I think, you know, yes, these things need to change. And yes, these women have been treated badly. But look at the way in which the men are coming behind them, the men's team. Mm -hmm. Look at the way that they're amplifying their voices. And let me tell you, you know, women's football does not have the spotlight on it. It deserves at all time. But let me tell you, Victor Ozyman has the spotlight on him. And for players like him to have the courage to call out the federation is huge. And I think that actually this is the spark of change. I think I, I do have hope, although this seems like a really frustrating situation because they're finally getting the traction that needs to, to happen for these changes to be made. So I think there is there is hope. Allyship is important and it's important to get it from all fronts. And I know. Uh, we've dedicated some really good time to uh, ventilating the subject. So, again, just great that we could dig into Banyana and this way and the Super Falcons. But I would not like us to forget about our North African sisters in Morocco. I mean, absolutely incredible to get out of the group. I think a wonderful achievement for North Africa and the Arab world. But against France, they just weren't, you know, you could see that they weren't, they didn't have quality across the park to be competitive. Um, I guess, Alistair, we'll, we'll keep it with you. Why is it that they can't seem to compete against the bigger nations? Is it as simple as my assessment that the quality isn't there? They certainly have a very well-established coach. Yeah, I think I think I spoke about this at, at a preview for the for the round of sixteen matches, and and, and I think. I think it's certainly not the coaching. I think Renaud Pedros, in my opinion, is probably the second best coach at the World Cup, only behind Serena Wigman. Um, I think he's he's superb. But, and I think for me, it's Morocco. What we've seen is a a you know a debutant's naivety. You know, we've seen that they play really well, but as soon as they let in one goal, their heads dropped. And you could see the way in which Khadija Eremichi, the goalkeeper, who's you know for the most part had a good tournament completely lost her head when that first France goal went in. You know, she was punching the ground, kind of completely losing her mind instead of picking herself up. And, you know, we saw that the difference between, say, Banyana against that Italy game. Banyana went behind. Immediately, the, the players are gathering around each other to pick each other themselves up. And I, so I think that's part of it. But I also think, again, this shows in which Morocco has developed faster than any nation in the world in terms of women's football. And when you when you develop that fast, there are growing pains. And I think the biggest one for me is is that lack of physicality and, and competing with the pace of these European teams. I think technically, tactically, Morocco are brilliant. They have an excellent coach. They have some supremely gifted players. You know, you know, even beyond the the Tagnauts and the Shebeks, we saw you know Wazarawi come breaking out in this tournament. She looks fantastic. I cannot wait to see her. Uh, in years and years to come because she's still, I think, only 19, 21, something like that. Same with Lahrami. But I think it's just they just can't keep up with, with the pace of the big European teams. Um, and, and the, you know, and you could see the way in which France moved the ball. You know, they're an excellent team. And the same with Germany. Once they move that ball really quickly, you know, the Moroccan players, particularly a lot of them, still play in Morocco, which, again, is a developing league, is a lot, you know, is fully professional, unlike South Africa and Nigeria's. But... I've watched games in that league. It's not at a fast pace. It's not at a frantic pace. So I think for me, it's just, they just couldn't keep up with the pace of these big teams, which is why when they played really good teams like Colombia and South Africa, but teams that aren't as physically dominant, that can't move the ball as fast as the European teams, they beat them. They were excellent. But I think for me, it's just this, this Morocco's achievement was getting out of the group. And I think they've done brilliantly. I think they can hold their heads high, um, even if, you know, they've, they've succumbed to quite a kind of, big and heavy defeat.
Zane, you mind if I add something to that? Or, or sorry, did you want to say something? My apologies. No, go, come right in. Morocco's greatest asset they currently have, which is ahead of them, is time, Zane. Is time. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, if you listen to Alistair during the ladies, if you listen to them, if you listen to some of the points he mentioned, which I actually went in and had a look at, um, the facilities and what they currently have in preparation for these teams. Uh, look at our, the, the coach they currently have. It's just a matter of time, Zane. All the elements and resources are there. It's a matter of time before this country becomes a big hitter. It's a matter of time before they put on a performance like the men's Moroccan team. It's just a matter yeah. of time. Well, well that was, that was going to be my question, Courtney. So you've transitioned it nicely. I mean, we saw this team make the WAFCON final. They did exceptionally well to make the round of 16. Are they here to be a force on the continent? Zane, it's, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And why is it going to happen? I'll give you two reasons. One reason is they've got all the elements and they've got time with them. They're going to get better, number one. Number two, the other countries on the continent, i.e. South Africa, put obstacles in their own teams. That's how they're going to improve. So Morocco is going to go ahead of them. The Moroccan FA is not trying to hamstring their own their own team but this consistently happens with other african countries i.e nigeria at the world cup i.e south Af south africa at the world cup it's, it's happening and like i'm saying i know we, you know people always say oh you've been very negative here courtney but people don't like the truth anyway say people don't like it but here's the truth it's gonna happen at the fcon when Bafana go it's gonna happen firstly Bafana shouldn't be at the fcon Okay, but it, they've got there, and it's going to happen there. How are we talking about Bafana again? <laughs> oh, no, no, we're not talking about Bafana. We're talking about the frequency of obstacles in our teams that disable us from doing well. Morocco has all the attributes, they have all the resources. It's a matter of time before this team rockets and moves forward. Wonderful. And listen, I have two more questions, guys, as we look to wrap the pod. And I know there's a lot of people listening out there who have a lot of thoughts and um, want to share them with us. So please, place your comments on our YouTube account. Search for the On The Whistle podcast. Find us on Facebook, On The Whistle podcast. You can search there. Twitter and Instagram, OTW underscore podcast. Let us know what you think about the African team's performances. Let us know what you think about our assessments. Let us know if you agree, disagree, or have any questions. We love hearing from you. But as we close out the pod, lads, I just have two more questions. One is we've obviously seen a historic World Cup for the African teams here. Do we expect the African teams to close the gap by 2027 when the next Women's World Cup comes around? Football development is not something that can be done in, in a four-year cycle. Um, and, and I think we're, we're going to see that, you know, in, in, and we, but what, one thing I will say is for me coming into this World Cup, there was a huge concern because at the AFCON, the one word I used every single time I, you know, I wrote an article, I was interviewed, as I, and I talked about the AFCON was I said, this is competitive. For the first time in African football history and women's football, every single team is competitive. You know, Burundi was going, yes, Burundi was playing a 16-year-old, you know, is a team with infinitely less resources with Nigeria. They still push them. You know, gone are the days when teams just are going to easily win 9-0, 12-0, whatever. And that that's what struck me. You know, Uganda, Senegal both pushed Morocco all the way. You know, even even Banyan and Banyana were pushed in a lot of their matches. It was not an easy ride. Um, and, you know, we've seen the emergence of Zambia and Morocco. For me, this World Cup was, was the next step, was me saying, I, I wasn't so sure about this World Cup. As I was saying, the rest of Africa seems to be catching up to these top tier nations. But how are they going to keep compete with the rest of the world? And the, the answer is they're competing, you know, they're competing and thriving. Now, do I think an African team is going to win the 20, 2027 World Cup? No, I don't. I hope I'm wrong. I hope that Nigeria can go get one better. I hope Banyana can do it. But I think that these things still take time. And I think that's the ultimate thing is my biggest fear is that particularly in South Africa's case, a golden generation and a, and a wonderful coach has papered over the cracks. You know, because I look at the South Africa team and it's not a young team. This is a team coming towards the end of its cycle. You know, your Janes, your Katlanas, your Magayas, your Seoposenways. You know, these are not young players. And Bane even, I think she's 32, 33. You know, Matlo is, is almost 40. So this is an old, older team. 
And so for me, the biggest concern is that these, these federations rest on their laurels and say, look, we're doing a great job. Look how well our team is doing. But then in eight years, suddenly Banyana will, will be doing really badly because they haven't been developing the next generation. So I think for me, there is the potential there for in four years, if these, you know, just look at Morocco, you know, in three years, they came from nothing, from nothing. You know, again, I've, I've said this before, 2016, 2017, they went more 16 months without playing a single game, friendly or nothing. They didn't play it. Seven years later, they're at the World Cup. They went in three years from never being at an AFCON to qualifying, pre preparing for it better than any other team, getting to the final and getting to a World Cup. If, if, these, if these four teams, because let's not discount Zambia, the unbelievable talent in that squad, which unlike South Africa is very young, you know, Barbara Branda, she's 22, 23, Rachel Kunananji, 21. You know, this is a very, very young team. If these federations get their act together, invest, invest, invest in the next four years, yes, I think these teams will be competing in the quarterfinals, semifinals. I think, yes, absolutely. I still think they won't be favorites. You know, England, the US will be coming back for revenge. You know, Japan has shown that they're top, top tier side. And a lot of these European teams will keep developing. But I think we have the tools we 100% have the tools on our continent to be competing for the finals, not just for the round of 16 at the next World Cup. My answer is no. But I've got a question with my answer. The Indominable Lions, 1990 World Cup. You know, got to the quarterfinals against England. They were offered rewards for their performances. Do you know when those rewards were paid, Zen? 2020. There's a culture within our continent to create obstacles to allow people to move forward. I can't see it happening. Morocco is the only shining light, and this is why I said, with time, they will get better. Uh, will an African team win uh, the next World Cup? No, because Morocco won't be ready. I agree with Alistair. But Morocco will become a team that will get ready. Now, where do you, where, where do you feel the difference? Where do you feel the change in difference in terms of football across? You know, because if you look at football within Europe, there's so many women's football teams, but there's also a culture of change here, saying, You know, and I'm going to make a very small example. I play social seven-a-side football on a Wednesday night. We now have four ladies that play in that team. Four ladies. Why? Because the, the, the brand of football has really been extended across absolutely everybody within the country. Is this happening in other countries? No, it's not, Zane. No, it's not. It, it, it's just it's saddening, Zane. It, 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 it's a negative point, but will it close the gap? No, the gap won't close except for Morocco. Morocco is our only hope for a gap closing. Well, listen, it's important that we reflect our views honestly and authentically and unvarnish. So, <coughs> excuse me, maybe that'll be the jolt the federations and the national associations need to get their houses in order, particularly the teams we focused on. Now, my final question to you guys, we can keep it short and sharp. Who is going to win the Women's World Cup and why? We're in the quarterfinals now, so prediction time. I, I think for, uh, Courtney's taken my answer, but not not by saying Sweden, but by wearing his England top. Yeah, you know, for me, for me, for me, it's 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 a coin flip. But it, it's for me, it's a co coin flip between England and Japan. They're the two best teams for me. I I, I say Sweden. Um, I just love their industry. Uh, I, they're absolutely fantastic. Really, really a well defensively set up team. Uh, I think they, they're coming good at the right time. Um, I, think, I think they're fantastic. And also, they are such a threat from set pieces. There's the other thing. They, and this is where a lot of other teams struggle as well. So I think Sweden got a really good chance. But I think the two where Alistair mentioned as well, the, the winner could come from them as well. It absolutely could. I think England were lucky to stay in the tournament. I think Nigeria gave England Nigeria gave England the opportunity to stay in the tournament. <laughs> Nigeria didn't want to win that. And and I'll go back to your point. Listen, 
Yeah. Nigeria's penalties against Morocco in the AFCON were some of the worst penalties I've ever seen, and they carried them into this tournament as well. You know, um, and Alistair, the point you also made, when they went down to 10 men, Nigeria basically lost their head, yet they were the advantage. So I, I, I will go with Sweden. Um, but Zayn, I want to pay, I want to pay a huge positive to the referees of the tournament at the moment. I must say to you, the refereeing standard in this tournament has been fantastic. Like some of the decisions that were in some of the games we had, and let's just go back to the Nigeria England game. There were some difficult calls in that game. And the ref got them spot on how they are dealing with the players. And I do like the explanation, the NFL style uh, talking to the crowd and letting the crowd know why the decision has been made. I think that's an absolutely exciting game. You know, basically the refs have made it easy for the game to happen and for us to understand the game. I, I think they deserve a lot of credit for this tournament. Sure. And when it comes to my predictions, I'm sort of with Ali. I'm, I think Japan are my favourites to do it. I think they've played some really good football, very well organised, technically very good. I like the work ethic in that team. And then the other ones that I think are getting hot at the right time are Spain. So if you look at the bracket, it looks like Spain and Japan are on course for a semi-final. And I think the winner of that takes the tournament. <clears throat> Spain are coming right at the right time. And I just like what, what Japan have from a team perspective. So that's where that's where I'm sitting at the minute. Here's a question for you, Zane. Uh, you and Alistair both picked Japan. How does such a short nation defend so well from set pieces? I'm saying that's that's what Desiree Ellis needs to be asking. Because they were unbelievable. I couldn't believe watching the Norway game. They just never looked... But I think it's just it's, it's unbelievable preparation. Yeah, it's, it's organization. It's just preparation. And you can see they work on it and they work on it. And good homework. You know, I've been to um, the Nadeshiko's home base just outside of Fukushima in, uh, in Japan. It's a wonderful facility. They have great investment with coaches and video analysis. A very well-prepared team. <clears throat> Excuse me. Training, diet, resource. And they do their homework probably better than most teams out there. All right, guys, listen, we could keep this pod going for a long time. Thank you for giving your time, energy, and thoughts. It's obviously sad because our African teams are out, but one way we can be cheerful. Round of 16, three teams. We had two in the men's World Cup with obviously Morocco making the final. So overall, lots of positives. Alistair, Courtney, thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to more successes and more talking points going forward. I bid you farewell.